This was the only thing Rick Simpson knew for sure after he rediscovered the healing abilities of cannabis extracts 16 years ago. Today, if you say the same, cannabis is medicine, and if anyone tries to convince you otherwise, there is only one question you can ask them. What do you know about the endocannabinoid system? If their answer is no, I don't know nothing about the endocannabinoid system, then you can just tell them that the answer to the question why cannabis is medicine is actually hiding in our own body because we all got in our bodies what we call the endocannabinoid system. Today in this lecture, I will do my best to give an answer or explanation to these three questions. What is the endocannabinoid system? How cannabis oil can cure and control many different diseases and medical conditions? And what is RSO, or Rick Simpson oil? We should educate ourselves and learn something about the endocannabinoid system before we form an opinion about cannabis for medicinal use. Chris Duval wrote in his book, Cannabis, People may be judged by how they use plants, and plants by how people use them. To be able to understand why cannabis is medicine and how its use is beneficial for humans, we need to go back in time for a moment, only for a moment indeed, because this plant's history began long before human history. The earliest physical evidence of cannabis is fossil pollen from 130,000 years old sediments from Lake Baikal. Records and artifacts indicate that cannabis has been cultivated for more than 10,000 years, but the exact date of its first use is unknown. For this, for many different cultures, cannabis is a sacred plant. It has been our companion since the earliest days of man, and its role in the ancient world was diverse. Food, fiber, medicine, and as a religious sacrament. The scientist Carl Sagan proposed that cannabis may be the first uh, world's agriculture crop. So in 1977 he wrote, it would be really interesting if in human history, the cultivation of cannabis led generally to the invention of agriculture and thereby to civilization. This plant has cosmopolitan status because cannabis grows on all inhibited land masses to about 60 degrees latitude, a distribution broader than any other crop. Indeed, cannabis grows on each and every continent, well, except Antarctica. Cannabis started out not as a drug of abuse, but as an ancient medicine. In the year 2737 BC, the Emperor Shen Nung of China, the founder of Chinese herbal medicine, recorded the first use of cannabis as medicine. At that time, the plant was used to treat malaria, female disorders, and many other illnesses. So, well, here you can see him, the Emperor Shen Nung, testing cannabis. Well, he personally tried each herb, including actually the ones who were poisonous, before he recommended their use for healing purposes. He personally tested them uh, to ascertain their medical value and, uh, and effects on the human body. So today we know that cannabis has been used for thousands of years in Asia and also was very popular for hundreds of years in Western medicine. Here you can see the bottles because it was used in American pharmacopoeia. So cannabis was therefore considered a medicine uh, at least 2800 BC until the 1940s. As you can see on this picture, it was listed in American pharmacopoeia. Weed, pot, ganja, Mary Jane, marijuana. 
So in the last centuries, cannabis has, uh, however, become an open secret in many countries around the globe. And its use generated a diverse lingo uh, whose evolution continues. The word, can word cannabis is a Latin form of a word, a Greek uh, word cannabis with the first letter K. Uh, in, nine, in 1753, Swedish botanists invented our present system of plant classification uh, using the lingua franca of his time, Latin. So he named this plant cannabis sativa L. Cannabis sativa means cultivated hemp, and the word, the letter L, actually means according to Linnaeus classification. So the English word ham and the Latin word cannabis both refer to the same plant. Did you know that for the etymologist, the word marijuana has been mysterious, appearing seemingly from nowhere. The word's origin is considered unknown. We only know that it was first published in Mexico in 1840s. So politicians in the United States of America, where all this demonization of this plan began, they were looking uh, the word to scare a public. They were looking to some foreign sounding word and to lie the drug with immigrants also, and of course keep it away from the doctors who've been prescribing this cannabis medicine for centuries. So the systematic demonization of this plant, as Jack Herer, who was the leader of hemp movement, said, was, is the work of drug policies propagated in and by the United States. So, illegal status of cannabis is a recent phenomenon and is based not upon scientific data, but upon social political goals and economic structures. Well, I'm so happy to know that this is something that is changing right now. We are witnessing this change in so many countries around the world. A narcotic with no medical value. Uh, this is how the single convention on narcotic drugs in the United States in 1961 classified hemp cannabis. Since then, the word cannabis uh, gained a special connotation. So since then, it looks like we are talking about two different plants. We got good cannabis, which is for textiles, and bad psychotropic cannabis. When in reality, the only difference explained by Martin Lee is high resin plants contain the phytocannabinoids. I will say something more about this later. Turpentoids and flavonoids, all the compounds that he have proven beneficial medical effects. Industrial hemp, this good cannabis, uh, is low resin and therefore typically low in cannabinoid content. Hemp is not an optimal source of CBD or other medical compounds. So industrial hemp contains less than 0.3% THC. So today we know that cannabis contains almost or more, because they are still doing research, than 500 components, 66 of which are not found anywhere else in nature, and that is why they are called cannabinoids. All these compounds work together. It is known as the entourage effect. We know so much, yet we know still so little about this plant. Although this is one of the most investigated therapeutic substances in history. In fact, more than 24,000 scientific articles have been published on cannabis and cannabinoids. So, what is the endocannabinoid system? To understand the endocannabinoid system, we shall make a short journey to the last century. In modern history, it all began in Israel. At the time, young scientist Raphael Meshulam started his research in Israel. Raphael Meshulam is called the grandfather of the cannabis research, and he started his research, well, essentially nobody was doing it. Why? Because cannabis was illegal. It was not available for most of scientists. So Professor Mashulam was not aware of this legal problem, so while surprisingly he obtained some hashish from the police. Whoa. 
one of the topics that I decided to work on was the chemistry of the plant cannabis sativa. Cannabis had been used for thousands of years, both as a drug as a recreational agent, but surprisingly, uh, the active compound was never isolated in pure form. I decided, together with uh, uh, my colleague Yechiel Gaoni, to go and do research and find out what are the compounds present in cannabis, and particularly, what is the active compound, active compounds present there. Well, a scientist should try to find topics of importance. And uh, I, I thought that this is a topic of importance. I knew that the police have a lot of uh, cannabis hashish that's being smuggled from the Lebanon, and after all the legal things were completed, they usually burn it. I was at the Weizmann Institute at that time, a very young person. I went to the director of the Weizmann Institute, the administrative director, and asked him, do you know anybody in the police who can supply hashish uh, to us for research? So he called one of his uh, friends, can you supply uh, cannabis to one of our researchers? And I hear from the other side, somebody shouting, is he, meaning me, is he reliable? And uh, the administrative director, who actually almost didn't know me, said, yes, of course he's reliable. Let him come over and pick some cashish. I went over, I didn't have a car, took a bus, got five kilos of hashish, went on the bus, and people in the bus after 15, 20 minutes just started asking, what the hell is this smell, very unusual smell? I mean, I had five kilos of hashish in my bag going around. But I guess you are the only person in the world that took five kilos of hashish from the police and got away with it. Well, uh, probably yes. It turned out that the police were not allowed to give us cannabis. I didn't have the permit from the Ministry of Health, therefore I had broken the law and the uh, police had broken the law and we should go to prison. Well, it doesn't work that way. I went to the Ministry of Health and some of them were colleagues of mine and the others knew what I was doing, so I said, I apologize, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. Next time when I want hashish, I'll go to the ministry. If and when I needed hashish, I went to the Ministry of Health, I filled the form, I drank some coffee with them, they gave me the permit, I went with the permit every time to the police, the police, I drank some more coffee with them, and I got my hashish and went back to the lab. We started working on those five kilos of hashish. We didn't have a safe, it was just in one of the cupboards in the lab. Nobody really was that interested. So we started extracting it. We started using modern methods. Now, this is important. Up till the mid-60s, even before that, in order to find the structure of a compound, one had to do a lot of reactions. Then, and we were one of the first to do that in Israel, we found that by using the proper instruments, one could find the structure of compounds without doing a lot of chemistry. We put the compound on a column, it is absorbed here in the two or three compounds. This is the way we separated originally the compounds from cannabis, but that was many, many, many years ago. We separated about 10 or 12 compounds, and these compounds included the only one active compound. Active, we tested at that time in monkeys. I had a colleague who worked in a nearby institute, and he had a colony of monkeys, and he and his group indeed tested these compounds in monkeys, and surprisingly found that only one compound did anything in these monkeys. It sedated them. They didn't sleep, but they were sedated. On the basis of this particular observation, we decided there is just one active compound, and surprisingly this is true to this very day. There is only one major active compound, uh, which is named now Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol THC, and this compound causes essentially all the hashish 
type, cannabis type effects that we know so well. And Professor Meshulam prophetically wrote, we are in the middle of a small therapeutic revolution, which should bring us over the course of the coming decades, new medications in many different domains. Professor Majulam's discovery of THC initiated the modern era of cannabis research. Yet, it was just the beginning of scientific journey in the world of the mother plant. It took another 24 years uh, to understand how THC is causing its well-known effect. Back in the 80s, researchers were trying to find out how cannabis, I mean THC, affects human brain, and they discovered the first of two receptors. In 1988, Dr. Ellen Howell in the, from the United States, um, she was the first one who found the existence of cannabinoid receptors in a rat brain. In 1990, uh, they decided, to, they, they discovered at the National Institute of Mental Health, also in the US, they mapped the location of cannabinoid receptor system in several mammal species, including men. In 1993, uh, they isolated the second receptor. So the two receptors are known as CB1 and CB2 receptor. Both are found throughout the body but the most common is in the brain and in the immune system. The receptors actually works like a lock on a cell membrane, waiting for a specific key to bind to it. So the receptors that are stimulated by THC are in our own body. Professor George Kunas from the United States, whose current research is focused on the biology of endocannabinoids, said, the next obvious question was, why are there receptors in the human brain for a smoked substance? How did God know that his creations were smoked cannabis? The scientists hypothesized that humans do not have these receptors for the THC key from the plant and that there must be our own cannabis-like key. And they, they started to look for our inner cannabis our own version of cannabinoids that our body produced for us for more pur purposes, useful purposes. So the receptors are made for compounds that we produce, not because there is a plant out there, as Professor Machuan said. So there are some compounds in the body itself that actually mimic cannabis. And they can be found in brain, glands, connective tissues, and immune cell cells. So most of the people who had experience with the plant will tell you how they, great they felt, in bliss, happy. So I'm sure this is one of the reasons why they call the first of um, neurotransmitters, the cannabinoids like neurotransmitters, an endemite. Ananda is a Sanskrit and Pali word for joy, bliss. Only three years after, in 1995, the second compound made in our body was discovered. So the scientists named these compounds indigenous cannabinoids or endocannabinoids. A very serious group of uh, researchers has recently published a paper saying that the endocannabinoid system is involved in essentially all human diseases. If you combine CB1 receptors and CB2 receptors, they cover most of the organism, at least in mammals. We are mammals. We are mammals. Okay. But uh, when you talk of mammals, you talk of horses and dogs and mice and rats and rabbits and lions and we all share the endocannabinoid system. I believe so. I believe so. And it has been demonstrated in many species. 
because now suddenly everyone has cannabis in their bodies, or everyone has a cannabinoid in their bodies, so it can't be bad. These molecules that we all have are so critical from the birth to the death of each of us in health and disease. Our body is made up of trillions of cells. Each and every cell is a living organism, and they need to communicate with themselves and cooperate with each other. They all need to be in harmony for the good of the whole. So, what is the job of the endocannabinoid system? Its job is to regulate the flow of signals that are being sent uh, between cells with one goal, maintaining balance. We call this balance homeostasis. It is very important how our internal environment responds to changes in our external environment. So the endocannabinoid system regulates many of the most important physiologic pathways in the human body, including cardiovascular activity, pain perception, hormonal regulation, immune fun function, inflammatory reactions, inhibition of tumor cells, and many more. The Italian researcher Dr. Vincenzo Di Marzo noted that the endocannabinoid system is essential to life and affects how we relax, eat, sleep, forget, and protect. The endocannabinoid system determines how your cells try to right themselves when something goes wrong and imbalance occurs. So, how is this endocannabinoid system connected to the cannabis medicine? How cannabis oil can cure and control many different diseases and medical conditions? Can I ask you a question? Are you aware when your thyroid releases your thyroid hormone? Well, only if you got superpowers. We are not aware of so many different functions in our body. We are not aware of all these different chemicals, reactions and processes in our body, but that doesn't mean that it's not happening. So it is the same way with the endocannabinoid system. So, we do not feel how it works either, but that doesn't mean that it's not there. Our brain cells make and use the endocannabinoids to make sure that our body is functioning correctly. The endocannabinoid system is involved in essentially all human diseases. So this is very important. Dr. Bonnie Goldstein from the United States, she explained what role cannabis plays in keeping our endocannabinoid system in balance. So this is the key information to understand how and why cannabis is medicine. So when your endocannabinoid system is not working properly, Dr. Bonnie Goldstein said, you may have an imbalance which can manifest as a medical condition. So there are no pharmaceutical medications that directly address an endocannabinoid dysfunction. The cannabis plant is a natural medicine that can help balance the endocannabinoid system for a number of medical conditions. Clinical endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome, or CEDS. Well, endocannabinoids are found naturally in a human breast milk. So while we receive our mother's endocannabinoids, and our body makes their own cannabinoids or endocannabinoids, our bodies do not store them in any reserve, resulting in inactivity when not supplemented. So this inactivity eventually results in a deficiency. So referred as to clinical endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome, which may be the underlying cause of age-related illnesses, along with inflammatory and autoimmune disease, even depression, PTSD, uh, diabetes, 
chronic pain and cancer. Is it possible that such a wide spectrum of illnesses could be attributed to deficiency in cannabinoids? Well, research suggested so, because the endocannabinoid system regulates homeostasis. For healthy people, cannabinoid supplementation may be a powerful preventative measure against disease, because cannabinoids from plants affect the endocannabinoid system as well. So, cannabis is also for a prevention. So the main question is why your doctor doesn't recommend cannabis as a cure or as a prevention? Well, as one doctor said, cannabis remains a subject where it's more likely that the patient will need to educate their doctor first. Unfortunately, many doctors around the world, it's not their fault, but uh, even if cannabis is legal or illegal in their countries, they don't know nothing about the endocannabinoid system, but simply because medical schools do not offer courses in cannabis medicine. So this is how cannabis prevents, cure and control many different diseases and medical conditions. Here you can see the list, and it's huge. Alzheimer, autism, cancer, glaucoma, hepatitis C, multiple sclerosis, pain, PTSD, epilepsy, and many others. Now we know this for sure, because modern science has already confirmed that cannabis is a factor for most uses which were also described in the ancient medical texts. In January 2017, the National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine of the United States published a new report on the health effects of cannabis. This 500-page document provides an overview of the research in the past 15 years on the health impact of cannabis and cannabis-derived products, covering a vast amount of scientific material. Basic and clinical research has grown in parallel with public and medical interest in such a way that more than 24,000 scientific articles have been published to date. For centuries, many natural remedies have been known to people of different cultures, and this knowledge has been traditionally passed down from one generation to next. The very basic idea of plant as medicine dates back, back and to before recorded history. The medical systems of ancient civilizations and even of the Western world to about a hundred years ago were based on the use of medicinal plants. In other words, on substances which nature has already provided for us. With the onset of the modern Western medicine, a great number of these natural remedies have been forgotten or worse banned. You know, if we are talking about cannabis, even though some of them have been knowingly and carefully used for hundreds and thousands of years. Cannabis is one of these plants. There is one thing we all have in common. We all care about our health, and we all care about our loved ones, and we want to do what is best for them. If there is a safe and effective medicine that can be powerful and that can treat and control so many different diseases, we should be able to use it. Back in 2004, Rick Simpson did not have any knowledge about the endocannabinoid system uh, and he didn't know uh, that the answer to the question why cannabis is cure and how it's possible that cannabis can help in so many different ways that can cure and control so many different diseases, according to his experience, that is actually hiding in our own body. So Rick Simpson claimed that cannabis oils extract is panacea, a cure oil because he saw that this oil helped so many people with so many different medical conditions. As a matter of fact, Rick wasn't the first one who called cannabis a cure-all. 
the Mongolian Academy of Science did research on Mongolian traditional medicine and the research found that the Mongolian tradition cannabis was used to treat different diseases. They actually called a mix of three different herbs and one of them was cannabis, a cure-all. However, for the Western world in the 21st century, it was one man who rediscovered the healing abilities of cannabis oil, of cannabis extracts. So, what is RSO or Rick Simpson oil? So the story about RSO and Rick Simpson started back in 2001, when Rick started to ingest cannabis oil that he made for himself in the hope that this extract will help him to deal with the post-concussion syndrome. And he had this post-concussion syndrome after the head injury. And it did help. Not only with this, but a few years later, he cured his own skin cancer. And there the story begins. Here you can see the uh, title of a documentary, Run from the Cure. It's a film by Christian Lorette, and it's available on Rick's YouTube channel. So after he cured his own cancer, uh, he wanted to share this story with the whole world. Of course, imagine, you cured your own cancer, you want to share this story. So he was growing plants in his own backyard while he was still in Canada. He had a lot of plants, <laughs> so he was making the oil and he was giving this oil for free to many people because the word has spread in his uh, small town and the whole area and people were coming to take the medicine for free from him. So with no medical knowledge, with no scientific background, Rick Simpson was not uh, able to provide the scientific evidence to back up what he was saying. But his evidence was a living proof people who have been cured. Sometimes they were coming just because they wanted to, unfortunately most of them, they were coming in a terminal uh, uh, stage of cancer. But then suddenly they were taking the oil and their diabetes was gone or they were able to control their multiple sclerosis and so on. So growing cannabis was against the law in Canada, of course. I mean, Rick was aware of the fact that he's breaking the law. But he even went to the police. He gave a statement that he's growing these plants, that he found this cure, and that he will continue to do this because he wants to help all these people who are coming to his place. So he couldn't believe himself, actually, what he was witnessing, but it was all true. So thrilled with this discovery, he contacted many political parties in Canada. But as he said, nobody did a thing because Nobody took him seriously. He wasn't a scientist, he wasn't a doctor. So, Rick may not be a scientist, but he just listened to his inner voice, like he said so many times, and he's used his common sense. So, he was deeply disappointed by the system, of course, because he said nobody did a thing with the evidence he was providing them. So, he decided to share his story and to publish the recipe, how to make your own cannabis oil, with the whole world. So Rick Simpson put up the phoenixtears.ca website on the, or, and he made the information people needed to heal themselves free for all to use at no cost. That was back in 2004. Rick did not even try to patent this oil or the process. He just wanted to share this with people around the world so that they can be able to heal themselves. After curing his own, own cancer, diagnosed by his medical doctor. He contacted many institutions in Canada, but this information will go unnoticed. Unfortunately, all the doors were shut in front of him. So what you can do? Then you can just share and spread the word. So facing a wall, he decided what to do next. Hey, of course, I must not forget, so the legal system didn't forget him, of course. I mean, they came to his place, to his house, they raided him a few times, and they cut all the plants, they took everything from him. Once he had a uh, hundred, uh, uh, hmm, maybe you can correct me how many plants were there. <laughs> 1,620. 
1,620, but in the report they put the wrong number, it was less, in the report, police report was even less, and then he was complaining, like you didn't put the right number of plants, how many plants I had in my own backyard. I, I mean, I know how many plants I had in my own backyard. <laughs> so after his plants were cut down by the law enforcement, his court case ended with a $2,000 Canadian dollars fee, uh, and no jail sentence because he was giving the oil for free. So they cannot put you in jail if you are doing something illegal, growing cannabis, making the medicine, and give it away for free. So there was no traffic. So um, this leads us to the third question I will answer in this lecture. So what is RSO, Rick Simpson oil? Here you can see the main characteristic of Rick Simpson oil. So it is made from the dry buds of sedative indica cannabis. Indica strain. We got indica and sativa. The strain should be pure indica or at least 90% dom indica dominant. The strain should contain 20% THC or more. Recommended solvents are light phallic naphtha or 90-90% isopropyl alcohol. When produced properly, the oil contains 90% or more THC. The finished oil must be amber in color. So all the instructions are available on Rick's website, phoenixtears.ca. So at first he named this cannabis oil Phoenix, the Phoenix Tears, not Rick Simpson oil. He didn't use his own name to name this, plant, uh, this extract he invented, but uh, Jack Herer, who was the leader of a hemp movement, actually he was the one who coined this phrase and then still stayed like this. So Rick described his extract in, back in 2004. He put this website and this extract is cannabis is in his most concentrated form. So as Dr. Jeffrey Dock wrote in his book, Extract, Cannabis Extract in Medicine, the promise of benefits in seizure disorders, cancer and other conditions, he wrote, before Rick and his oil, most people were only smoking cannabis or eating it in a small quantities in a form of edibles. Rick Simpson himself, he wrote a few years ago, I consider myself just one of many who have found a way to cure cancer, and I certainly was not the first one to produce an essential oil from the cannabis plant. So, RSO is made from the dry buds of the female flower of sedated indica varieties cannabis. So, analysis, you can see here, a quote, analysis of the various parts of the plant confirms that the major source of cannabinoids, which is very important, is in the female flower. Drying the crop, if somebody's here who is uh, growing his own cannabis at home, then they know. <laughs> drying the crop as quickly as possible will reduce the cannabinoid losses, and this is achieved by keeping the plants in a stream of diffusing and we air. So, mm -hmm. the oil contains 90% THC or more. So many people said that it's not possible for the oil to contain 90% of THC. THC is very important components. Uh, in 1974, researchers at the Medical College of Virginia in the United States, so we are talking about 1974, they found the evidence that cannabis damaged the growth of three kinds of cancer in mice. The DEA shut down this study. All these compounds in the cannabis plants, phytocannabinoids, we call them phytocannabinoids because these cannabis can be only found in the cannabis plants. So THC, CBD, and all these minor, we call them minor cannabinoids, which are CBN, CBG, CBC, all these different <laughs> letters. So the scientists, they actually, it was easier for them to call them this way. It's too short uh, a word the name, they work together. It is known as the entourage effect. So many people claim that it's not possible to make the oil which contain 90% THC oil. So this is the part of the analysis that I got from one gentleman here in Europe uh, who made the oil for himself for personal use 
he was following Rick's instructions. Obviously, he had a good material to work with, uh, very good quality cannabis. And here you can see Delta 9 THC, 92.50%. So, we said the THC is very important. THC is pharmacologically and toxicologically most relevant and best studied constituent of the cannabis plant, responsible for most of the effects of natural cannabis preparation. So it is postulated that the beneficial therapeutic effects of cannabis affects from the interaction of different cannabinoids, although research has primarily focused on THC and CBD. But it's possible that other components within the plant are also very important. So, today we know that THC has got um, different properties. Psychoactive, this we know, <laughs> it can be psychoactive, but reduce pain, stops uh, nausea or vomiting, uh, induce sleep, it's antioxidant, inflammatory and very important anti-tumor effects. CBD on the other side is non-psychoactive with no high effects. That's the reason why you're ingesting CBD oils. Uh, there is no high and this is the reason actually why most of the countries CBD is the only uh, component which is legal. So CBD reduces also pain, relaxes sp muscle spasm. That's why they use this for multiple sclerosis, epilepsy. Uh, reduces anxiety and depression, antioxidant also, and also has an anti-tumor effects. So, Rudolf Bernstein wrote in his article, Chemistry and Analysis of Phytocannabinoids and Other Cannabis Constituents, he said CBD is the next best phytocannabinoid after THC. So I present the list of different diseases before and the medical conditions for which cannabis is very effective medicine, but I'm aware that the most controversial topic when we're talking about cannabis oil is can cannabis oil cure cancer? So since I'm not a medical doctor, I'm an anthropologist, so I think that the answer to this question should be provided by medical professionals. There are multiple mechanisms of action identified by which cannabis kills cancer cells. And they're divided into various categories. And among these are anti-proliferative effects. Normally, that's, that's one of the hallmarks of a cancer cell is that it just keeps reproducing. So if you stop the reproduction, that's an anti-proliferative effect. There are anti-angiogenesis effects, and this means that the cannabinoids will stop the tumor from being able to elaborate or grow new blood vessels to support the growth of the tumor. There are anti-metastatic effects, and that is simple enough to mean that the cannabinoids block the ability of the cancer cells to spread into other tissues. And there's another effect that has a wild name, apoptotic effect. Apoptosis refers to the ability of cannabinoids to speed the death of the abnormal cells. And that's something that is, is especially important in cancer because you're, you're able to hasten the death of the cell without disturbing the normal cells around it. Seth Research Laboratories in California have recently demonstrated that in some tumors, cancer cells are killed by marijuana, while the other healthy cells are left untouched. Cells that stop moving and become still white dots are dead cancer cells. The ability of cannabinoids to kill bad cells while protecting healthy ones is particularly important when we're talking about brain cancer because of the so-called blood-brain barrier. The brain has to be sheltered from outside influences that might hitch a ride on the bloodstream and cause havoc. What is exciting and unique about cannabinoids is that they can pass through the blood-brain barrier because of their slippery, fat-loving nature. 
Cannabinoids get right into the brain's cancer cells by moving easily through the cell's membranes, which are also composed of lipids. The evidence is piling up in mice-infested labs that the endocannabinoid system, when stimulated by cannabinoids, has an anti-tumor effect and can instruct cancer cells to commit suicide. This was done by Manuel Guzman's group uh, within the past less than 10 years, and what they showed there was that originally that THC, when injected into a brain tumor in mice and rats, uh, a significant number of those animals, would the tumor would regress and disappear so that you actually had survival of rats that, uh, that would otherwise die. And they examined all the surrounding nerve tissue and that was all fine. Because remember, once again, cannabinoids protect nerves. Dr. Manuel Guzman is a professor of biochemistry and molecular biology in Madrid, Spain, and is known for his groundbreaking studies on medical cannabis. <laughs> de las células tumorales, un efecto inhibidor de lo que es el crecimiento, la multiplicación de las células tumorales, lo que hacen es disminuir el crecimiento de los tumores. If cannabis might be the miracle cancer cure that everybody's been searching for, then why don't doctors everywhere know about it? People have a hard time believing that cannabis can have all of these fantastic effects that are described. But what we're doing is we're just stimulating a natural system that's already there. This has been developing for hundreds of millions of years. The early, the invertebrates, the sea squirts, the hydra, there are primitive endocannabinoid systems in those organisms, back, dating back six, seven hundred million years ago. The cannabis plant came along maybe 50 or 60 million years ago. Excuse me, but I just need to be sure. Can you hear this video? Is it loud enough in the hall? Okay, 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 thank you. So the title of my lecture is RSO, From Alternative Medicine to Science. So one doctor also wrote, Simpson showed that the ingestion of concentrated cannabis oil is the best way to use cannabis medicinally and that, when, that doing so uh, could directly treat various diseases. He's most notable for claiming that cannabis extracts could put virtually any cancer in remission. Thousands have used his protocol to treat their cancer. Unfortunately, cannabis is still illegal in many countries around the world. Yet, pharmaceutical industry is trying to take over, although we are talking about the plant. Cannabis is plant. So they are trying to synthesize and standardize a plant's chemical components. So they, today we are aware of this classification of cannabinoids. We got indigenous cannabinoids. We call them endocannabinoids, which are produced by the human body. We got herbal cannabinoids, the kind found in the cannabis plant. So herbal cannabinoids, you can find them in different plants, in many different plants, but this specific phytocannabinoids you can find only in the cannabis plant. And synthetic cannabinoids produced and distributed by <coughs> pharmaceutical companies. So, Brent Stein wrote in his article, and his article was published in the book Marijuana and the Cannabinoids, cannabis has been characterized as a synergetic shotgun. In contract, for example, to dronabinol, synthetic THC, Marinol, nose and Marinol, a single ingredient he called silver bullet. I watch women die every day. I watch children bury their moms. So I know what is in front of me and I'm doing everything I can to Lana. prevent that. Lana. Sarah Amenzo and her family are running out of time. She has stage four cancer, the chemotherapy isn't working, and the doctors say there's nothing more they can do. Left with no options, everybody speaks about cannabis oil. There's a certain stigma, especially um, being a mother, of doing cannabis oil. Uh, 
you know, everyone looks at it like you're getting high, and it's not. It's a medical. It's it's a natural option that the government's ignoring, and I I want to live. I have to live. Cannabis has been used as a medicine for centuries. It's legal in half U.S. states. A British drugs company is trialing a new cancer drug, and Britain's leading cancer research group is interested. Cannabinoids are certainly very interesting molecules, and there's a lot of research. There's hundreds of papers being published looking at their chemical properties against cancer cells. Turning that into effective treatments is a long road, and certainly it's not going to be the one cure for cancer, because nothing is. This is how you're able to gauge what level of activity is going on in your body. Stephanie LaRue says she has evidence cannabis has worked, which is backed up by her doctor. The cannabis works. No chemo. I only did cannabis, and the tumors are gone, and the scans I have is, is evidence and proof of that. Kind of like, what more do you need? A lot more, according to one of the world's leading cancer doctors. Um, this is chemotherapy. So okay. these are natural products, you know. The man who helped cure Lance Armstrong's cancer needs data and real scientific evidence. Until somebody proves it, whether it be the manufacturers who put together a clinical trial, whether it be doctors who get government funding to do it, or patients who say, here are my records and let's put it in a medical journal and be transparent with what I had, what I was treated with, and what my outcome was, then until that it's snake oil. Again, I'm not trying to impede progress or say it's bad, but at the same time, I don't want people to get false hope. So what is the evidence? Well, there are hundreds of lab reports that have been published. A study on mice which showed that it worked. A human trial that saw eight out of nine patients respond to treatment, even though they all did die in the time you might expect. Dozens of charities and organizations are starting to think there's something in it. Making the oil is still an underground industry. The cannabis is legal. The flammable solvents he's using aren't. We then pour the liquid into the pan. So this is the finished product? Yeah, this is the finished product. And do you think this is a cure for cancer? In many instances, it is and it can be. It depends on the person's particular condition or their state, how advanced the cancer is. But we've seen thousands and thousands of people get better from using this oil. And it's what Sarah Amento is trying. I squeeze out a very little amount, and then I just, I believe it's the best option. I've seen it work for others, and um, I'm hoping it'll work for me. It is her only hope, but it is also unproven medicine. Alice Lee, BBC News, Los Angeles. So why is still this cannabis oil, I mean this medicine, why is still illegal? If so many people around the world had wonderful results. So to be honest, Rick and I, we encourage people to grow their own plants. I know that the pharmaceutical industry doesn't like this and all these illegal growers or dealers, they also don't like this. But some may say that by doing so, encouraging people to grow their own medicine, we are also breaking the law. But every week we receive so many emails because you need to understand that cannabis medicine, I've heard that it is sort of legal here in Germany, but in many countries is illegal. So every day we receive so many emails on our email address, which is connected to Rick's website, phoenixseries.ca, from people who have been scammed because they're buying this online from scammers, criminals, because I need to tell you that a lot of people, individuals, companies, and criminals are using Rick's name. Yesterday I talked to one guy who told me that one company from the Netherlands is using Rick's name in a way that they're selling RSO, and they said that Rick certified this. He's standing behind this. Look, like, really, I mean, we live in Croatia, and how come I don't know that Rick is doing some business in the Netherlands? So, uh, well, yeah, and I think a month ago, we received an email from one lady. She was also, she was, has been scammed for, I think, more than $3,000.
So all these people, they're really, they're sending money. They're sending money to all these criminals. And then we found out that uh, we got an orphanage in Nigeria. This is something that the scammer told this lady, that he, he himself is Rick, and that we got an orphanage in Nigeria, and if she's going to buy the oil from him, actually part of this money will be donated to this orphanage in Nigeria. So it's crazy. I mean, we got so many. I got the list of this fake email addresses you would not believe. At least more than hundreds of them. I mean, we are doing our best all the time on our social networks and on the website. It says we do not sell the oil. We are not in a position to grow. We live in Croatia. It's illegal there. We don't have a project. So um, in the article Botany and Natural Cannabis Medicine that has been published in a book uh, Cannabis and Cannabidiol Pharmacology, Toxicology and Ther Therapeutic Potential, Robert C. Clark and Watson, they wrote, largely as a response to political pressure and the limited availability of high quality commercial cannabis, the home growing of this crop, whether for medical or personal use, is a trend rapidly spreading across North America and Europe. So after I told you, I mean, with such a horrible thing that I mean, people are dealing with who wants to use this medicine, I mean, this is understandable. People will break the law. So it is no secret that growing cannabis for personal use is quite simple. And it's very simple to learn how to do it. It is a plant. You need to provide nutrients, proper light and environment, humidity, pest control, and you will have a good quality to work with, to make your own cannabis oil. So we live in a world of communication, and with the little help of this internet and the word about this man who claimed that this, his cannabis extract healed thousands of people, this word has spread all around the globe. We saw this uh, was actually for BBC, this last video we saw about this lady who is taking this oil, this was made in, US, uh, in the UK for BBC. So a lot of people have been illegally healed since then. We are witnessing the growing frustration, as I said, of patients who cannot obtain the oil, and they've been scammed. So even if we do not have all the scientific evidence about the endocannabinoid system, and the benefits of the use of cannabis, as Dr. McKinnis wrote, patients can choose and do have the right to choose treatments even if research on them has not yet found a rich sponsor. After the scientists discovered the endocannabinoid system, this should be the end of all debate about whether cannabis is legal or is a medicine or not. So since this discovery uh, of med medical uh, conditions associated with it, this dysfunction is recognized in the medical community, it is time to recognize and accept cannabis as medicine. Dr. Leston Reespoon said it is about time to end this cannabinophobia. He called this age of uh, cannabis prohibition. He also said that the future historians will likely look at this epoch and recognize it as another instance of the madness of crowds. So as I said, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm an anthropologist and since 2014 I've been involved in the work of my husband. So our main goal is to spread the knowledge about healing abilities of the cannabis extracts. It's very important to say, remember my story and all these criminals who are using Rick's name, so these are the two, only two websites Rick Simpson is affiliated with, phoenixseries.ca and simpsonrammer.com. So as I said, we are not in a position to grow cannabis, therefore we do not supply the oil. I'd rather be illegally alive than legally dead. Um, this uh, young gentleman, he's a teen uh, Colin Turner from the United States, 
uh, he's got Crohn's disease, he was using the oil, but he needed to move to Colorado where cannabis oil is legal to cure himself. Dr. Jeffrey Dad wrote, for years, run from the cure, this documentary about Rick's story, that detailed the Rick's work and the medicinal effects of cannabis oil was seen as a detriment and danger to the med medicinal cannabis movement as by exaggerating the potential of cannabis. The film might discredit its real benefits. Now the tables have turned and now ta not talking about the full capabilities of cannabis extracts is considered to be denying people life-saving opportunities. So imagine yourself in a situation where you know that this extract can save your loved one, that can help to cure or control different diseases and medical conditions. And that the only way to provide this medicine is to break the law. So these people did not wish to break the law, but they had no other choice. When a man is denied the right to live the life he believes in, he has no choice but to become an outlaw. There is one African proverb that I heard many, many years ago. Uh, it says, um, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you, if you want to go really, really fast, go together. So it is very important for people in different countries just to join their forces and simply ask the man from their governments to legalize this plant. Although, to be honest, I would like to see this plant free, that you can grow your own cannabis. Why would you purchase this from pharmaceutical industry, I mean from drug stores? You need to have a choice. If you don't want to grow your own plants, fine, then just go and buy it. But if somebody wants to grow it, why not? It's a plant. So I just hope that I addressed uh, the answer to the, the three questions from the beginning in a good way. So, what is the endocannabinoid system? We said, endocannabinoid system is a group of indigenous cannabinoid receptors located in the brain and throughout the nervous system is involved in just about every chemical process in our body. It works to maintain homeostasis and is an essential to life and affects how we relax, eat, sleep, forget and protect. The second question was how cannabis oil can cure and control different diseases and medical conditions. So the cannabis plant is a natural medicine that can help to balance endocannabinoid system for a number of medical conditions. The imbalance of the endocannabinoid system in our own body can cause different diseases or medical conditions. And the last one was, what is RSO or Rick Simpson oil? So Rick Simpson oil is cannabis oil made of the most medicinal strains, strong sedative indica strain with 20% or more THC. So Rick Simpson oil, when produced properly, THC levels are in the range 90%. Dr. Lamir Hanush, who have been for the last 30 years in Israel with Dr. Rafael Mashulam, the godfather of the cannabinoid uh, medicine, the one who dis uh, discovered THC in the cannabis plant, they wrote one article, one of many, they published together, and they said, the use of cannabinoids in medicine has been the dream of several generations of scientists. Thanks to Rick, who was loud enough, along with many, many activists around the world, cannabis has been legalized, and this medicine is available to so many people in need. Well, not in a way that many of us who are fighting for human rights would like to see, but at least this is I don't know, at least the beginning, the first step. Today it is clear that the prevention as well as a holistic approach 
to healing are vital. I promote a holistic approach because I believe that our bodies are a small universe and that everything in our body is closely connected. That every single cell in our body has her own intelligence, her own integrity. So most diseases are a reflection of a lack of balance in individual's life on the physical, emotional and or mental level. We also learned today that the can, uh, imbalance of the endocannabinoid system in our body can cause different diseases or medical conditions. Cannabis is a God-given plant. It is something that nature itself provides for us to use as a medicine. In recent years, I've become involved in cannabis activism because I think that every human being has a right. And if he wants to use this medicine or not. We need to walk in this world with our eyes open to see things for what they are. We need to question things to gain the knowledge that is our true power. We need to raise our voice for what we think and feel it's right. To be active participants in our society and in our own life. I felt this is something worth fighting for. Thank you. Now we are going to play video, if you, or you need a break after this, but we are going to play video, it's also available on uh, Rick's uh, YouTube channel. If you go on phoenixtears.ca on YouTube channel, then you will find uh, Making Cannabis All with Rick Simpson or on simpsonrambador.com also YouTube channel. This is the film we made two years in India and it can help you if you want to make your own medicine. Thank you so much.